Rutherford County has got the term Little Detroit. It actually dates back to the 1930s when people were going up to the Detroit area to get cars. It was hard to get cars, and of course that was during the Depression years, and there was not a lot of cars available. And they found that they could get uh, probably pretty good buys on the uh, cars and, and brought them back to Rutherford County. They uh, became aware of an opportunity to take second hand, they call them, uh, trade-in automobiles from some of these greater hubs in the north uh, that were still in very uh, usable condition. They just needed reconditioning and, and uh, some safety features brought up to date and things like that. But they created a cottage industry co kind of a thing. But it really flourished, uh, the used car business, after the war when our men and women came home from the war, World War II, and the roads were improved and, and cars were uh, becoming more of a, having more of a demand for cars. And so that uh, one thing led to another as far as going to Detroit, and, and dealers soon found out that was the source to get cars. And at one time, there was at least 165 car dealers in Rutherford County. I guess you could say I was pretty much born into the car business. Uh, my father went into the uh, car business uh, in the early 40s. Uh, he was discharged from the Navy because of flat feet and he came back home and uh, uh, he purchased a, an old car from a friend of his and he sold it and made some money and he, he told me that he said, hey, this is a way to make some extra money. I started out at a, a garage there on Highway 64 when I was 14 years old in the summer months. I uh, started working there for uh, $15 a week with a free dinner and free desserts. And I like the desserts. as. I kind of got into them. They made money on me on the job, but they lost money on the desserts. He was uh, in the horse business and this and that and the other because we lived on a, on a farm, but he still always fooled with some cars. Even when I was young, he would send me like to South Carolina. Uh, I would go because I had a legal driver's license. But then he had me selling when I was in the 16, 17, 18 year old. We started out not with a dealership, but just with a backyard operation of used cars. I always, as a little boy, loved cars. And in the summertime, you know, when the school was out, I'd buy an old car, fix it up, and set it. So uh, when I got out of high school, I uh, was working at a department store, and I left that department store on Saturday night after graduating on Friday night. Sunday morning went to Detroit. I remember my dad bringing a car home, it was probably a late 40s, and uh, I remember him saying that they had bought that car, he and his brother, and they were going to process it and sell it, and if they made money, they was going to go buy another one, maybe two. And this is kind of how the car business got started out. Father's car business was more or less wholesale. Cars was getting very scarce, and uh, so he went to uh, uh, went to travel to Baltimore. And he would stand on the side, corner side of the street at a stoplight or a stop sign, and go up to people that stopped and ask them if they wanted to sell their car. And uh, a lot of people say no, and some people say sure. So he bought quite a few cars. Uh, that way. I think it had a right big impact. Uh, I'd say some of you uh, individuals leave the mill and, and kind of get a taste of the car business and first thing you know he's going up the road to Baltimore or wherever his location was he bought at you know and he'd get good at it and learn the game. My uh, father used to send me to Washington DC and then some of the big sales I would go like I say to the big auctions and uh, buy uh, one time she was with me at the sale, I bought 61 cars. My uncle, my dad's brother, he's four years older than him, he started buying cars in Detroit back in the 30s, and he would bring them home and detail them and resell them. Then the war came, and he and my uncle both 
were drafted into the war during the World War II. After the war, they, when they came out, it's about 1946, they decided to go in business together. They named it Rupert J. Moore Used Cars because my uncle was doing the buying and they thought it should be in his name. And he would go to Washington, D.C. and buy cars and they would bring them home, detail them, and uh, resell them. Eventually, he moved there and just, just stayed up there in D.C. and would just come home occasionally. We would go to Detroit and, and, and buy about six cars every two weeks. And we done the body work, painting, mechanical work. We did everything to them. And then we cleaned them up, took them to car sales. The chief, and one <laughs> chief, you want to bid on this? And then I had some other names too. We won't go into those. <laughs> So, I mean, some of the uh, big dealers, uh, they might have had another name for me. Big dealers from Greensboro, and up, in, uh, up in the northern states and all. Because I had a lot of nerve and I would bid against some of the big wheels and out of Charlotte and Greensboro, and they didn't scare me. Uh, if I wanted a car, I'd see how much they wanted it. And so I'd just stay right in and bid <clears throat> and, and Sometimes I would buy as many as 60 and 70 cars at one sale. In the days of the used cars, he was gone every other week. And of course, first to Detroit and then to Washington. And uh, he would buy cars. Sometimes he would be back in a day's time. Sometimes he never took his shoes off from the time he left home until he got back. Be kind of careful, you know, how you buy, you know. You I think you, uh, most time you make your money when you buy the car, you know, because if you don't buy it low enough, you know, when you get that stuff in the middle, your, your paint work and body work and cleanups and detail and your sale fees, you know, all that's got to be added in. If you don't got enough margin in there between, it ain't going to be much left. <laughs> Transporting is a lot of difference now than it was then because, and then there was no interstate highways like when we left Shelby, we went right up 74 through Chimney Rock, on up through the mountains, Tennessee, Kentucky, on two lane roads, going and coming. Uh, in the early days, uh, actually pulling down uh, from Washington or Maryland or wherever, uh, we used what we called a, uh, a knuckle bar, which was just a, a one piece sort of bar that uh, sort of had a knuckle that, that fastened around the center of the front of the front bumper on the uh, back car and the, uh, the rear bumper on the front car uh, uh, and those were mainly in the cars with in the 30s and early 40s uh, model cars where they had that type bumper where you could uh, do it that way and they were very very dangerous uh, you had to be really really careful with them and uh, then, then uh, we they come out with a newer uh, tow bar later on, which was sort of like a a, a V type situation where it, it uh, hooked to the to the rear bumper of the front car and was spread out to the front bumper of the back car uh, to where it would be more stable, to, so you could handle a lot better. Still, it was very tricky to drive, and uh, so you had to really. You more or less, you couldn't hardly drive the front car. You more or less just sort of had to let it drive itself, so to speak. And uh, it, was, it, it was a tricky situation. But once you learned how to do it, it, was, it wasn't too bad. Sometimes it was difficult to get the uh, tow bars on some of the bumpers. That was when one car was pulling another car behind it. And you could be out there on some pretty cold days tightening those nuts and bolts up and your hand had slip and they call that thing a knuckle buster sometimes because I could see some knuckles get torn up pretty bad with that. The tow bars were kind of a enigma themselves because they were, it wasn't easy to tow a car with those things and the guys that did it had to develop a unique skill and an ability to look ahead and plan ahead because they were steering and braking for two cars and the back one wasn't always wanting to behave real well either. It was dangerous to a degree. I guess we all drove too fast, but uh, you had to 
remembered that that car was behind you. You couldn't take chances. Uh, the roads weren't anything like they are today. And it was a lot of bad weather. Uh, they wouldn't keep, didn't have the equipment. States didn't to keep the roads clean like they do today. There were a number of drivers here in the county that says that's all they did was make the trips also to Detroit and when the cars were purchased by the dealers, they hopped in them and put a hook up between two cars and came home. They finally nicknamed these people towheads because that's what they did for a living or some of them did it on the side. I remember the tow bars being when he would have the tow bar and I did not like to ride in a car that was being pulled with a tow bar because it would bump and it would scare me as a child. Well, actually, how that come about from what my father always said was that, that in the Frederick, uh, Maryland area, he saw that truck going down the road and uh, Again, he ran it down and stopped the guy and asked him uh, what, what kind of car truck, you know, and everything it was, and, how, and would he sell it? And the guy said, well, yeah. So he bought it, and it would haul four cars. Well, they purchased a car hauler in, in the late 40s. It just hauled four cars. When I was a kid, we used to play on it. They could also carry someone with them with a tow bar and get two more cars on. Back in the 70s, my dad had a car carrier that would haul six cars at the time. It had a little uh, six-cylinder flathead uh, Chrysler engine in it, a little Dodge engine, and uh, it uh, we would have to replace the engine in it about every three or four trips. The little motor just wouldn't couldn't take it. And uh, back then, overhead bridges and stuff were a lot lower than they are today. And he come under one bridge one day and took the top off of, split, took the top off the two top cars. So he come pulling in down at the, at the lot with two cars on top with no tops on. So, uh, and that was, uh, that was an experience. I was just a young kid and I thought, my goodness, what, what's happened? And so we finally, he finally sold it because it just was giving us so much trouble. We were loading a car, of course this was in warm weather, and we were loading cars one time and there was a pin that holds those skids so that the skids won't move when you're driving up on a truck. And somebody had forgot to put the pin in and Dad was standing at the right side of the car to make sure that I had the wheels lined up right going up those skids. And the skids popped loose and the car fell to the right. And I remember seeing Dad stand there beside the car and I thought the car had fallen on him. And I come out the driver's side of the car as it was laying on its side to see where he was. And when I got out, he was standing at some bushes off to the side. How he moved that quick, I don't know, but I was afraid the car had fallen on him. Hey, you've got to learn to get the cars as looking as new as possible, I mean, clean. Ever. We had been around car dealers a lot, and we knew how to clean them up and even wax the door jams and make sure everything was like a new car. And that you can sell them a lot better if they're like that. Uh, of the cars, you had your car lots, and probably more importantly, you had your body shops, you had your mechanic shops, your paint shops, and your trim shops that supported the used car business. I've often wondered how many cars passed through here in a week's time back in those days. I mean, they were all towed in here. The people uh, that was involved in processing the cars, uh, from the cleanup fellows to the body men, the tire men, the people that sold accessories, there's no telling how many people there were. Well, that was, that was the old game, they did it back then. You had a, a tire grover uh, and uh, had to heat up. And then you followed the grooves up the tires. 
he said the way the style of the tire was, you know, and there'd be like five five lines in the tire, so to speak, and you'd have to cut all five lines, and it'd make the tire look good again. <laughs> uh, then you'd have to paint over it, you know, over the tires to make, make it look all black and pretty again, you know. The speedometers, that was a, a game people played back in, and uh, you had to kind of learn how to do this. You had to learn how to take your head off to start with, and then take the back part apart, and uh, get to where you can see the numbers. And uh, you had to take like a ice pick, or in some cases you take it upon apart and then uh, turn the numbers like a, like all these little square toys uh, that you, yellow, red, and blue, and all, you can turn them to get them all lined up, you know? Well, that's basically where this worked. Uh, that was a, that was a kind of way of life, I guess, back in for a lot of the dealers. If you if you've got a car, of course back then they fixed up a lot a lot of red cars. People was in that business. Just they'd take two cars, cut them in two, put the back end on it, and, and sell it for nothing ever happened to it. But of course they've changed the laws a lot since then. <laughs> but one thing that came about uh, 50, 60 years ago is they called a bondo, and that was a real miracle drug for the for the automobile industry. That was a a big change in body working on cars, especially the old rusty cars I used to get out of Detroit. Because uh, it was easy, you know, to form and uh, shave down and sand down and get you ready for your first primer. And uh, that's one of the first parts of getting a car ready to go, you know, to processing. And uh, then you go from there to your cleanup shop and then you have to get the old gray compound out. And, what it, and back then, most all your stuff was lacquer. It's all gone now. Uh, that was the process they had uh, painting wise, and then you had to uh, water sand it and buff it out, and then polish it, and then wax it, and get that high gloss shine. A little bit like, uh, I guess you call it, uh, you got your uh, makeup artist in Hollywood. It's a lot here in uh, Rutherford County. And get the French fries out of the floor, the cigarette burns, the body work, the dents, the tires, fix them up, and make them look like this truck and ready to go to the auction tomorrow. I still always love to hear the chant of an auctioneer at the, at the car sales. So after they processed the cars, would take these cars to various auto auctions, uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, uh, Darlington, South Carolina, High Point, North Carolina, Bristol, Tennessee, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. There's any number of auto auctions around and those numbers grew over the years. And when they take them to the auctions, the dealers from various parts of the country would come to the auction to see what was there. Well, the truck, this truck here beside me, if I were going to sell it to the auctioneer, he's going to be starting off asking for 12.5, 12.5, anybody 12.5 out of 12.5? I got $11,000 on the money. Now 11.1, would you do 11.1 out of 2? Have it a 2, would you get $2,000? 11.2, 11.2, now for 11.3,000. Would you go 11.3? 11.2, now 3, now 4, would you get 4? So for 11.3, over here to number 216. That's how it's done at the auction only. They do it in a faster pace, uh, running them through about every 40 seconds there's a car going through the auction. My father's car business was more or less wholesale. We also did some retail, but mainly uh, wholesale going to uh, automobile auctions. Uh, we usually went to uh, Elysville, South Carolina was our, uh, usually the, the one, main one that we went to every Tuesday and uh, we would take anywhere from 10 to 15 cars every week. Uh, One thing I can back up a little bit and, and uh, share with you is going with my father to the car lots when I was like 12 years old. Now that was good, I liked that. Uh, yeah, if I'd had a choice going to town, going to the movie or the Griffin Theater was back then, or either going to the car lots, I'd pick the car lots because it just, it just thrilled me to get to go and, and watch my daddy trade and listen to a little bit of how they did it and pick up a few things on how to play the game. Rupert J. Moore used cars was in business uh, until about 1970. You got to treat them uh, like a friend, not a customer. And you got to be truthful with it. In other words, don't take them something that's got a problem. 
that love of competition fed itself into car racing and, and real handily because they took what they had and made a, a car out of it that they could take out and race. <laughs> Auto racing and the used car business kind of folded together in as much as that the people that would be working in the body shops uh, obviously had an interest in cars and it was just a natural uh, thing for them to take the cars to the race. There was the Rutherford County Fairgrounds, the Harris Speedway, and uh, if they wrecked they could bring them back into their body shop and, and repair them. And I was kind of conservative because I, I drove I'd done my own work on my car, and I knew if I tore it up, I had to fix it the next week. So I'd, I'd run around fourth or fifth place to maybe the last lap or two, and I'd, get, I'd pass as many of them as I could before the last lap. They always said, be, watch out for me on the last five laps, because I was going on, you know, <laughs> as far as I could. The car industry and the racing folks in Rutherford County and Cleveland County and around were intertwined in that Forest City had one of the best racetracks in the south. It was a dirt, tra dirt track, it was five-eighths of a mile, and cars came from all around to run down there on this track. They came out of Georgia and Tennessee and different parts of North Carolina. I went to the racetrack one Sunday at Harris and a Thomas, butter brother Thomas Moat had a 50 Ford, and his driver wasn't there, and he knowed me. And I hadn't drove a car, and he wanted me to try it out. I went out there and drove it, and won the first race. It was a rough, you know, you, you had to build two or three cars a year because you'd tear them up, you know, you, you'd, you'd bump into each other and run into each other and everything else. That's just how far we drove. We drove, you know, a man running, they let you by, you moved him. You know, you didn't, you know, sometimes they'd want to fight, never did have a fight, but come close to it a lot of times. <laughs> my brother worked on the third shift, and I worked on the first, and I'd do my machine work at lunchtime, and our stay to stay at late, and, you know. I know one time we didn't have good brakes, and I found out that you could get a Buick brake drum and do some machine work on it and put more brakes on it. And, I, and aluminum to make shavings, you wouldn't believe. I had a pile of shavings, you couldn't carry them in your arms. And then one evening, the manager walked in the shop. I said, oh, Lord. He came over there and stood there and watched me a while, and he said, Red, what are you doing? I said, well, Mr. West, I can't keep no brakes on that race car, and I'm trying to make me some brake drums. He said, a well, man needs good brakes, and just turned around and walked out. You know, it scared me he's going to get on to me, but he didn't. Textiles came and went, and so as that happened, so did the fortunes of the people. But it, through it all, any given year, small business was always the primary mover, uh, the primary economic uh, engine, and uh, that was certainly true in the case of the, the automotive uh, reworking business. And probably racing in Rutherford County, in, in one sense of the word, you could say it was a forerunner to NASCAR, the multi-billion dollar industry that we know today. I started in Winston Cup Racing in 1976, and the commute from Huntsville, Alabama to, to all the races was a minimum of like 10 hours. And uh, Forest City was uh, right in, in, in the, the hub of it at that time of all the races. That was a good year. That was the first year we moved to North Carolina. And uh, I just wish I had moved, you know, a few years earlier because it, it is the best move I made in racing is to get closer to, to everything. And, uh, and personally, I'd rather be here than Mooresville or Charlotte. A good place to start a business because they have all the, the, uh, the places here that can support a race team.